I have so many things on my stool with me right now. Hey you guys, welcome back. So today we are going to be going through um, basically what your starter kit should look like if you are wanting to pursue makeup professionally. Just kind of like your absolute bare bones, what you need 100% for sure. And then we're also going to be talking about hygiene uh, with Trey at the end. I know the hygiene part sounds boring, the whole video is boring, but it's all important. All right guys, let's jump into it. Okay, so to start your kit off, I'm gonna talk first about tools. So a few things you always wanna have on hand is a pencil sharpener. You wanna make sure that you have one that has a small side and a larger side, cuticle scissors, a spatula and a palette. So you can buy stuff like this at like art stores or on Amazon. Same thing with the spatula you can buy on Amazon, no problem. If you don't have a palette, you can always use like wax paper as well. Um, it's just a little bit more wasteful, but if you're doing things like special effects, where you're gonna be using like adhesives and stuff like that, you may wanna use wax paper as an alternative. Then of course, tweezers and an eyelash curler. It's also really nice to have like some kind of hair clip, um, especially if your client's hair isn't done yet. So you can just kind of clip it out of the way if you need to. It's also kind of nice as well to put a tissue kind of around the hair. So you would just sort of put a little tissue around and then put this over top just to make sure that you're not leaving any kind of crimps in the hair. And then you have to have 70% alcohol and 99% alcohol. You wanna put those in some kind of a spray bottle so they're quicker and easier to use. 99% to clean, brushes, tools, whatever kind of thing, uh, and 70% to disinfect. I also always really like to have a brush cleaner with me um, just because it smells nice, but also because it worked really, really well where sometimes like alcohol wouldn't cut things as well as this. And so I always had the Cinema Secrets brush cleaner as well on location. You wanna make Make sure you are bringing your own paper towel um, just in case you need to kind of spot clean brushes or whatever. Uh, it's also nice to just kind of lay out a couple pieces of paper towel so you have something to kind of work on and make sure you're not getting whatever surface you're working on dirty. You also want to make sure that you have hand sanitizer on the ready. And then makeup wipes. You always, always, always want to have makeup wipes on hand um, just in case your model shows up with makeup on uh, or you need to take something off really quickly. It's also always nice to have like some kind of liquid or cream makeup remover um, just in case you wanted to do something like uh, you know clean up winged eyeliner you can just dip a brush into some makeup remover and kind of quickly clean it up it's also always nice to have uh, water in a spray bottle as well which you want to make sure you're changing out fairly frequently certain products are water activated um, sometimes you might want to thin something out with a little bit of water whatever it's just kind of nice to have on hand and then you want to make sure you have a range of disposables so this is your q-tips your disposable mascara wands uh, lip gloss wands stuff like that then it's always great to have a range of of skincare, hopefully kind of catering to, um, you know, a few different skin types, just in case you get someone in your chair that's, you know, super oily or super dry or really acne prone or whatever. It's nice to kind of have a few different things to kind of, uh, you know, cater to Whoever. Then of course you will need your brushes. Um, brushes are very, very important. We all kind of have our few like super favorite brushes that we use nonstop and we can't do makeup without them. It's always a good idea to stock up on those favorite brushes um, just in case you're working through multiple clients and you don't have the time to kind of spot clean between. And then any kind of sponges that you may want as well. Personally, I don't uh, really recommend using um, beauty blenders on clients, but we'll get into that later um, in the hygiene section, but you can always bring um, the little disposable kind of wedge sponges if you like them for kind of stippling out makeup or whatever. For brush holders, I always really liked having something kind of like this that had two ends to it. This is from Suva Beauty and it's nice because it kind of comes out like this to protect your bristles and then you kind of put the top on like that. And the reason I like having these two little sides is because when I start my job, I'll keep all my clean brushes in one side and then as I use them and they're dirty, I transfer them over to the other side just to make sure that I know for sure uh, these are the dirty brushes, these are the clean ones, and that I won't end up using a dirty brush accidentally. It also then makes it really easy to just quickly spot clean your dirty brushes and put them back with your clean ones, uh, rather than kind of trying to fish through and, and see which ones are dirty. So I really love that little brush holder for that kind of stuff. Um, but I also wanted to show you guys the Smith Folio. So this is from Smith Cosmetics. Um, it's always sold out, it's awesome. This is the smaller version, they have one that's quite a bit bigger, um, but you can change out the inserts that are in here. And basically you can just kind of put your brushes in there. This is really great for just kind of quickly being able to see what brush you need and pull it out. I also really love this for organizing any kind of like lip liners, eye pencils, stuff like that, um, because it just makes it really easy to see rather than kind of wasting time having to like rifle through, uh, you know, like a bag of them. These are just so beautiful and really well made. I, I wish, 
I was still a working artist um, because I know that I would have just loved this so much back in the day. In terms of primers and stuff like that, I find that this is kind of a personal preference. I'm not huge on face primers, uh, but some people really do swear by them. So it's nice to kind of have a range of face primers in your collection as well. I like to have a true eye primer as well. Um, a lot of the times I will just use like a concealer or whatever I kind of have on hand. Um, but depending if your model has like more sensitive eyes, uh, maybe you're working on mature skin. Sometimes a concealer can be a little bit heavy for that area. So it's kind of nice to have, uh, you know, a lighter eye primer as well. Then when it comes to foundations, I know this is something that people are always so worried about because it's the most daunting of all. Everyone feels like they need every single foundation. <laughs> this is where you really have to get good with your mixing um, because you absolutely do not need every single uh, color of foundation, but you do need to know how to mix any color of foundation. So I would recommend rather than buying shades one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever kind of thing, buying like one, three, five, and then being able to kind of mix accordingly. It's also always really nice to have um, some kind of mixing shades. Uh, I know Fenty has some really, really strong undertone foundations. Um, some that are like super yellow, super pink, super olive. It's nice to have stuff like that to kind of just mix a little pump in with something. Same thing with concealer. You don't need to have every single concealer under the sun. It's always nice to have a concealer palette. Um, so you can kind of just work from there and mix shades really easily. Then when it comes to brows, I love this. <laughs> Sorry, it's so dirty and disgusting. Uh, but this is the Anastasia Brow Pro Palette. I really, really love this guy because it just has all of your brow shades right there. So it's super kind of quick and easy and it's just small and compact. Anytime as a makeup artist that you can find something in a palette like this rather than having a bunch of loose pieces, it's way better. It's way more travel friendly. You're not gonna have to waste a bunch of time setting up all those little individual brow powders or eyeshadows or whatever. You'll just have it ready to go um, and super quick to unpack and pack back up. Then for eyeshadows, um, I like having kind of palettes as well. Usually you have some colors that you know 100% you always use. These are the colors I always use. You will know like you have like certain neutrals that you like use on everyone sort of thing. So this is the Pro palette from MAC, which you can just kind of get magnetic inserts for. You can buy shadows from a ton of different brands. It's standard sizing. And then if you want a little bit more selection, you can always go for something like this. This is the Makeup Forever XL Magnetic Palette. So it holds quite a few shadows in there. The one thing I will say about this is that uh, this is quite a thin kind of like tin or aluminum K, I don't know what it's made out of. It's quite thin and it gets dented quite easily. So that's just something to be conscious of. Also, because you can't see through this, um, it's worthwhile if you had a few of them to kind of label what's in there. So, you know, I would say like, this is like my blue green palette or whatever, just because again, if you're like rifling through stuff, needing to get kind of going right away, you should have it out and set up anyways. But regardless, I always think it's nice to kind of have products depotted like that and put into a separate palette, just because again, it's quicker, it's easier. And because I think it takes the pressure off of of uh, you needing to have like a specific brand name thing. I know this is something that a lot of new artists are really self-conscious about. They feel like they should have super high-end stuff in their uh, kit, but they can't really afford it. Just get that thing from MAC or Makeup Forever and just fill it with like cheap ColourPop shadows, Makeup Geek, whatever. Makeup Geek isn't really cheap anymore. Anyways, you know what I'm saying. Same thing for face. It's always really nice to have some kind of like contour and highlight palette um, where you have sort of like a range of tones. This is pretty white. This is pretty Caucasian, yeah. You can get bigger ones than these and just kind of pop in different shades that you know you use frequently. Same thing for blush. It's always really nice to have some kind of blush palette with a few different tones. This, this is a little fucking bougie. I mean, it's beautiful. But same thing, you can always get that kind of refill palette from MAC and pop in some different blushes and stuff. You always want to make sure you have a good loose powder on hand as well as mascara. It's really great to have a few different mascaras to kind of choose from. Um, I always really liked having one that was more waterproof, one that kind of was like fiber lengthening and one that was um, a little bit runnier actually. If you work on set and stuff like that, it's nice to kind of have a runny mascara in case like your actor is crying or they're in the rain and whatever and you wanna have like runny mascara. Just nice to have it on hand, you never know. Then when it comes to liner, I would never recommend using a uh, brush liner. Like any of the liner pens, um, I, I just, you can't sanitize it, so I don't recommend that unless you're gonna really like kind of squish it out onto a palette and use a brush to uh, 
you know, quickly apply it. I always gravitated more towards like gel liners and stuff like that, just because they're really easy to kind of scoop out and put on your palette uh, and make sure you're not contaminating your product. It's always great to have a good clear brow gel um, and even a clear mascara. Sometimes when you're working on younger clients, especially, it's nice to just kind of have something that's gonna lift the lashes and keep them in place, but not actually um, add any like darkness or intensity to it. Lash glue and lashes. It's nice to have a range of lashes as well and a range of lash glue. Um, you wanna make sure that you have uh, non-latex if you typically use a latex glue just in case of allergies. And with lashes, it's nice to have like a few kind of strip lashes that you know you like the band of. It's nice to have a few like kind of flares and individuals just in case you wanna kind of add a little bit but not like a full lash or whatever. For lip liners and uh, pencil eyeliners and stuff like that, it's nice to have a few different shades but you definitely don't need to have every shade in the world. Um, just the ones that you know you kind of use the most and like, you know, a good orange, a good red, a good dark lip. And then when it comes to things like lipstick and different stuff like that, um, I think it's fine if you want to have, you know, your few kind of like go-to lipsticks, but I always would sooner recommend something kind of like the uh, Anastasia lip kit. So with this, you can kind of just mix any shade you need rather than carrying around like 35,000 like loose lipsticks. If you get good at your mixing, you can kind of mix any shade out of there. So um, it's nice to have stuff like that kind of ready to go. So rather than keeping what if products in your kit, um, you can kind of have something like this where like, let's say someone was like, oh, I want a green lipstick for this photo shoot. You could be like no problem quickly mix it up from your kit i also used to always really love the makeup forever flash palette just because i loved having this kind of um just ready to go in case i needed some random shit mixed up like some kind of you know cream blush that's like a weird purple color or something like that you know it's nice to have this kind of stuff ready to go as well so that's basically it for your kit i know that a lot of people feel like they want to have so much stuff um but it's it's really not necessary you actually want to try and pare down as much as you can you want to have stuff on hand so that you can do anything you need to do um, But I feel like so many people carry around, you know, like a million different things because they're like Well, what if I need this? What if they ask for this? What if blah blah blah? You should be able to kind of get that uh, Look out of what you have in your kit without having to have like your entire collection with you So that is everything for what you should have in your kit now. We're gonna move on to um, Some basic hygiene with uh, our good friend Trey all right, let's jump into it. Okay, so we're gonna quickly go over, well, probably not quickly, but we're gonna go over hygiene. This is um, perhaps the most important thing you can know as a makeup artist. Mm. And I think this is also one of the least talked about things uh, in terms of like becoming a professional artist um, that's talked about online. There's not a ton of resources about it, I find. I think a lot of people really focus on products and they really focus on techniques and stuff like that, which is great and important, um, but hygiene is very important, especially if you wanna work on like a film set and stuff like that. Um, bad hygiene is what can get you kicked out of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, there are so many makeup artists out there. It's a dog eat dog world and yeah, the one time you shouldn't be dirty anyway, but the one time you're caught doing anything, th that's it. And actually going through a lot of the questions, um, I see a lot of people asking, how do you get more jobs? How do you get more mm. clients? And it really is being the best at what you do. And part of that is being clean. So let's go through brushes. How do you properly clean, sanitize brushes? Okay, so with the brushes that you go through, again, we were talking about having it, let's say, contained, um, you know, in a separate one. So every time you use it, put it in a cup so you know which ones are dirty. And when you do clean them, um, so you don't reach for a dirty brush by accident thinking it's clean using it on someone else. But when you do clean them, uh, I know that a lot of people get confused with the 70% and 99% mm. alcohol. Um, if One might think, oh, 99% alcohol is stronger. Then why can't I just go in with that? you use 99% alcohol to clean all the product out. So you let it run out. And what I'll do is I'll take a brush and spritz it with 99 and I'll wipe it on a paper towel and I'll do it again. I'll do it again and again until it runs clear. If you have a more dense brush, mm. really compact, then I fill a little cup or a shot glass um, with my 99% alcohol and I'll give it a really good swishing and then wipe it until it runs clear. And the importance of using 70% alcohol after that is that's to disinfect. The reason 99% alcohol doesn't disinfect is because it flash dries so quickly. So it's not 
slow enough to kill the bacteria, like it is ineffective. So 70% doesn't flash dry as quickly. So it gives it a chance to kill that bacteria. So 99 to clean and then 70 to disinfect. Also, I love Cinema Secrets mm. brush cleaner. So that I one's a really good, do you like it? I do. I have it's Oh, oh, oh I love, I love this Cinema Secrets and I have some here as well and I've um, decanted it because it needs to be easy to travel around for me. But um, this actually smells really nice, smells like vanilla. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of wonderful brush cleaners out there, but I find that some don't dry as mm. fast. Like that's Cinema Secrets and 99% are really good for spot cleaning if you're on uh, set or you're working between clients and you wanna quickly clean your brushes and stuff like that. It's always nice as well to give a nice shampoo and condition to your brushes, yeah. um, especially if they're natural hair. Um, alcohol can really dry it out. Keep uh, it conditioned because yeah. it'll keep your brushes nice and soft as well. Mm -hmm. You can feel the difference. Yeah, and for that you can honestly just use shampoo and conditioner. You don't need to like buy anything specific. Um, and for stains, shaving cream. Yes, yeah. So I use shaving cream to remove any stained um, skin that has been stained with blood. And I remember one day I tried on the brushes, let's say it's tinted with from Aqualiner or something and I've cleaned it and the bristles are just still stained and I tried it and worked really well and it leaves it smelling really nice. All of your products and stuff like that, you never want to leave because it's so easy to get products really dirty and disgusting. You always want to make sure that you're wiping them down as well. That's something that I see a ton um and that's like a pet peeve for me i hate when people have dirty products like this looks grody well and fine if it's your personal stuff but like if you are a makeup artist you should always have your stuff wiped down and clean you don't want to be kind of throwing it back in there dirty with like foundation all over it or like sparkles or whatever kind of thing again like your client sitting right in front of your station and they're looking at your stuff so if your stuff looks dirty all the time it just doesn't make them feel super confident and also layout maybe um like having a towel laid yeah. out and if you use a towel like let's say a tea towel or a face towel um i would suggest maybe getting something that is a little bit darker because if it does get stained and you yeah. launder it and it's still you know you can see color they may question if it's mm. dirty yeah or just paper towel and then in terms of sanitizing products and how to keep products hygienic um with pencils and stuff like that um, I always like to just like tip them upside down, spritz them with 70% alcohol, give them a wipe, um, sharpen. You know, sharpening is very important. I always sharpen after I'm done a client, but right before I'll work on a client, I sharpen again. The reason is because it's kind of nice for them to see, I yeah. think. For powder products, I feel like this is something that like is kind of argued. Like some people feel like it's not inherently hygienic. Um, other people feel like you can dip in. What are your thoughts? Damn. Ready for your hot take. <laughs> oh no. <gasps> okay. Yeah. I mean, when I learned in school, it's a dry product. It might not carry, um, bacteria, but the thing is I'm still paranoid. So what I do try to do is pick up enough product, um, that I'm going to use on so that you brush. Don't dip back. Exactly. Exactly. And if you do still maybe every once in a while, give your palette a spritz and a wipe down anyway. But yeah, yeah. there are sanitization. Like if you want to, if you're worried about it or that's something you're weird about or whatever, um, there are like that beauty. So clean is like a sanitization spray. You can spritz over top of powders. The only mm -hmm. thing that I found when I was trying to like sanitize powders is that it can sometimes change the She's, formula. Mm -hmm. a little. The consistency changes. Yeah. yeah. So really to split hairs then, um, I mean, we can say it is accepted for yeah. us to double dip cause it's dry, but when you can, um, switch up your brush, mm. have more available and, um, you know, if during touches, just make sure you've cleaned your brush so you can, you know, grab, yeah. grab a new one. So with stuff like, yeah, the potted concealers, um, lip palettes, whatever, different stuff like that. You mm -hmm. always kind of want to be going in with your little palette knife, um, scraping the product off, putting it onto a palette um, so that you're not dipping your brush back into the cream over and over again. This is another little debate. Uh, whether or not beauty blenders are hygienic to continually use. Um, I, I don't know. I personally feel like, no, I wouldn't want to use a beauty blender over and over again on a client, even if I was washing it as thoroughly as I thought I could, just because if you were to cut open a beauty blender and look at the inside, there is, you, you essentially can't, in my opinion, clean it 
completely. It might look clean on the outside, but it's never usually clean on the inside. And just because you are going to be using typically cream products with a beauty blender, um, cream products are what breed bacteria. Yeah. So. And really, is it worth it to put in all that time to mm. clean all your beauty blenders? Um, you know, it's great if you're working it, um, working on yourself with it. But for the most part, if you're a working makeup artist, if you do really want to use beauty blenders, you would have to have an abundance of them mm. for every client you go through, yeah. unless you are promising that you're cleaning it between each client, which there's no time for, there's no. no time for that. I think the easiest is just having, you know, a wedge sponge, or if you like a foundation brush, sure, but even that needs to be cleaned, of course. But you know, wedge sponges like this, it's like a beauty blender, but triangular, but this is, nice to kind of use and this is meant to be disposable you use it one yeah. time throw it away yeah and i do think like if if you find that you know because I, I love using beauty blenders for like my personal makeup and stuff like that you can get really cheap kind of like knockoff beauty blenders on amazon and stuff um so if you're working on like a reoccurring client like on a film set or whatever um one thing to have a beauty blender that's just for that client but if you are working on like let's say bridal and you're doing the bride and bridesmaids and whatever you in my opinion, you would probably want to have separate sponges for each person. For sure. But I think that's also where like you get into um, learning how to replicate the appearance of the fit, uh, like the finish that a beauty blender kind of offers with brushes, um, and not relying on needing a beauty blender to do that work for you. It's possible. Mm -hmm. How about eyelash curlers? Oh yeah, eyelash curlers. Mm -hmm. This is something that I think is oft forgotten. Um, to be sanitized because it's something that people just like I think don't think about as much um, But very important. It's very close to your juicy eyeballs. Oh juicy <laughs> it's yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And also it picks up on um, let's say you have oily eyelids. It doesn't matter it picks up on the oil the foundations um, You know, uh, maybe some resi residual mascara and it looks grody and it is it is gross if you don't clean it and you're moving it from one person's mm. eye to another eye. Definitely give that a good wipe down. And again, 99% to clean, 70 to disinfect. Eyelashes you don't want to be reusing. No. Pretty standard. Um, and this is something where I feel like a lot of people think they need super expensive eyelashes. Uh, if the client wants to pay for it, Sure. But yeah, um, no, they don't need to be crazy expensive. No. Um, I just like to make sure they have a nice flexible band yeah. so that it's comfortable and anything that looks, you know, not natural. With things like mascara, um, disposable mascara ones, uh, I used to even like using small, really, really small fan brushes to do people's mm -hmm. mascara. Yeah. You can even use like a spoolie if you want. You can like take a, like a brush spoolie grab a bunch of product out of there kind of thing and put it onto your palette and keep dipping back onto your palette yep. rather than dipping back into your mascara and never want to double dip. Yeah, I think that's the main thing. Everything should just be removed from the container yeah. and put on a separate um, palette just so you can keep double dipping in that palette for that one yeah. client. And with things like liquid eyeliner pens, yeah, that should Don't be a personal that. item. They're like cult favorite products. Like a lot of people have their absolute favorite like eyeliner pens and stuff like that and like specific formulas they really like. Um, when you're doing makeup on clients, it's better to just find formulas that you can kind of, you know, take take the product off, whether it's like a gel formula um, or a liquid that you can, again, put onto a palette um, and use a brush to apply it or whatever, but I would never apply the yeah. product. Yeah, and let's say it did come with a felt tip end and you really love that product, just squeeze the shit out of it like onto your palette, yeah. then dip from there from a completely separate yeah. Liner. And also one thing, this is not really with hygiene, but this is just more so with product waste. Always take out way less than you think you need. Because I think a lot of like students, especially, I feel like I would take out so much they product, gouge. Um, but you're just wasting product. Cause usually, hopefully you're not over applying product. Um, and it's, I think always better unless you're mixing like a highly, highly, highly custom thing like a really custom lip color that you're afraid you're not gonna be able to replicate for whatever reason or something like that okay maybe take a little bit more but if you're just taking plain product just take a little tiny bit um you can always grab more if you need to rather than taking a ton and wasting your product little goes a long way and that also stops you from 
picking up so much mm. and putting it on the face. Oh, let's answer some of those questions. Okay. Um, so someone asked, uh, this may be dumb, but do freelance MUAs usually get paid hourly or per job? What's a good rate to charge? Okay, so that's variable, yeah. right? So I'd say it depends on your experience and it really depends on the job. You can charge hourly or you can charge a daily rate. If you're doing, let's say half a day, you can also charge half a daily rate. Yeah. Um, when you first start off, I know a lot of times, maybe different when you're working in film. If you're working in film, a lot of times when you work on student films, you charge a kit fee and a kit fee basically means a, just a small fee that would help you cover your um, disposables, like your foundation your little kit. Yeah, and you can volunteer your time, but not your product. So if you're practicing and building your portfolio and gaining more experience, you may start with a kit fee and you can decide what suits you. Yeah, you yeah. decide what's appropriate. Um, once you start building more confidence and you know you know, you're, you're quick with matching skin tone. You're, you're good at what you do. You feel more confident. Um, you have more products in your kit and actually more you're experience. getting, yeah, lots of experience and you have, um, you're getting more calls. Then that's kind of a sign. You could start actually charging more, start upping your rate. I think in terms of like determining your rate as well, a lot of the times it is kind of, um, it can be location based as well. Obviously a makeup artist that is in New York city will probably not be charging the same amount as someone in rural Arkansas. So, um, you know, it's, that can kind of vary um, prices as well. And like, if you're just so lost and have absolutely no idea what to charge, you can always go look up makeup artists in your area online and like what they're charging mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Do a bit of research. Um, and just kind of see, like suss it out from there. You'll know whether or not you feel comfortable charging what they're charging. Like if you think they're like way overcharging and you're like, oh, I'm not that experienced. I can't charge like $200 for a makeup. Then you can kind of go from there. Um, I think the most important thing is like not undervaluing yourself and also just deciding you get to decide what's of value to you whether or not you want to do something for free or for a kit fee or whatever or trade for print mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah, trade for print. Print. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you you can decide whether or not that's valuable to you but I think it's important to not let people bully you into thinking that things are valuable just because they say so yeah um, like for exposure if that yeah. doesn't work for you then. yeah yeah because I mean I think that uh, again like a lot of people that are starting out they just aren't confident and it's un it is uncomfortable sometimes discussing rates or I hate that yeah it is mm -hmm. but you got you got um, to do it it's just important to be able to negotiate and stuff like that because you don't want to be getting into a rhythm of underselling yourself and also being known as somebody that uh will do every anything yeah because then you just perpetuate the idea that um you know makeup artists don't need to get paid yeah. or paid a lot let's say um what what's worth it to you right you're deciding and i get a lot of students asking me should i do this it's for free or it's really little pay i'm um, sure i get it we all have bills to pay we have rent to pay but at the same time if you need to build your skill mm. um you ask yourself is this worth it do and i your wanna... network as well sometimes yeah. there's things that come up that it's just a really good opportunity for you to network and yes. meet people that maybe you respect or you've heard about or you know are in your industry and they mm -hmm. constantly need artists and stuff like that and so yep. if it's an opportunity to work with someone that you think might lead to paid work um yep. then absolutely but it's just important to be able to know when what, and how to mm -hmm. transition into yeah. actually paid work but you decide for yourself yeah. if that's worth it to you because yeah. if something that's worth it to you may not be worth it to the next person and what would you say just branching off of that what would you say is like the best way for someone to start networking if they just like don't know anyone in their industry kind of thing ah okay yeah that's really difficult so mm. first off let's say film because that's where i come from you go out uh work on student films uh, you can learn a lot as well. Student films are super fun. On a student film set, you may meet that one person on set. You're gonna meet, let's say, 10 people. Uh, out of those 10 people, there may be that one person who has a project that's coming up right after. And if they like you and they like your work, they're gonna say, hey, Sam, I have another film. Do you wanna be my makeup artist on that? You work on that, you meet, let's say, another 10 people. And that's how you start networking. That's what networking mm -hmm. is. That's how work breeds work. You just get more and it starts to snowball. If you are are wanting to do let's say fashion photo shoots um have you heard of model mayhem yeah okay so you can go on sites like model mayhem or 
reach out to a photographer friend or just um, you know create photo shoots and start building your your portfolio as well, well but that's even where like social media can kind of play oh, into yeah. um, like influencer and that side like world aside um, you can use social media as a really great networking tool so for instance like you can um, find local designers you can find local photographers find mm -hmm. local models whatever mm -hmm. kind of thing and um, connect with them that way like um, you know do some trade for print yeah uh, collaborate collaborate and do a yeah. shoot like that that whole industry is all word of mouth yeah and, and it is personal experience mm -hmm. and even with things like bridal and stuff I mean it's really just kind of like thinking outside the box in terms of like getting into like your business mind and marketing and all that kind of stuff and when you think about things like bridal like okay like what what are brides doing in terms of preparing for their wedding they're going to florists they're going mm -hmm. to wedding planners they're going to all these different people mm -hmm. so that's where like it's really great for you to network with local businesses that yep. way and the hair salon yeah mm -hmm. like and, and you know they they get asked that stuff all the time. Do you know any makeup artists? Do you know any people who do hair? Do you know any whatever? Because they assume that everyone's all connected and a lot of the times they are. So if you can kind of like wriggle your way in there as well, that's a really great way to sort of network. I got a lot of my bridal clients from um, a salon owner because I, um, I went there to do a bridal makeup. Yeah, that was the salon that she goes to. So we set up there and she had her hairdresser do her hair. And the salon owner just really liked what I did mm. and liked that I was early and worked really fast. The bride was really late. And he reached out and said, hey, I have a lot of brides asking for makeup artists all the time. So I just dropped off a stack of cards and there's where a lot of my clients come from. Just stuff like that is getting creative and, and figuring out ways to network. I think a lot of people just assume if they're talented or if they have gone to school or they've put in the work kind of thing that the work will just come to them. They won't know you if you don't yeah. put yourself out there. You have to put work into yeah. you know, putting yourself out there. And here's what I do want to add. People building their portfolios. This is totally different. If you want to be an influencer, I think this is totally awesome. Stick with this, okay? But if you want to um, go out there and work on clients, mm -hmm. my recommendation is, this is my own opinion, don't have your own face mm, in your yeah, portfolio. Yeah, yeah. And I love the accounts with all these beautiful makeups on, let's say that one face, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But to me, that doesn't read as a professional makeup artist who's mm. up there working on different people. Yeah. And also like you want to be able to showcase because like a lot of the times we gravitate towards one very specific makeup style on ourselves. And that may not be, you know, indicative of like how you, the different ways in which you can do makeup. Because like, you know, even if I do my makeup more kind of like glam, more heavy, I might be able to do a really nice soft day look but if you're not seeing that um you know kind of those looks through other clients that i've done makeup on then your your mind is just going to basically yeah. be like okay well this you'll is look what like a one do. trick pony mm -hmm. and like it's also it's also nice for reference for clients um that are potential clients basically because they can go through um you know your portfolio or your social um media and stuff like that and find someone that looks more similar to them more similar to their skin tone yeah. their eye shape whatever kind of thing and say okay like she knows how to do it or he knows how to do it on whoever. So there, it's going to build the confidence in potential clients as well that they know that you can do a range of makeup and do a range of people. For those of you wondering how to build your portfolio, I say start off with doing makeup on your friends mm -hmm. or sister or whoever, you know, your mother even. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just take take your photos and put in your book and start start there. Yeah. Um, and, th and then hopefully you have enough faces that aren't your own. Your success really is in your own hands. So mm -hmm. it's not something that is going to land in your lap. I mean, there's that small like 1% that that happens to. Some but, are lucky, yeah. but you can't expect that. And <laughs> no, I think... and, and you shouldn't want to expect that. Like I think it's something that's really important to, you can make it happen for yourself, but you have to want to do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And same with, let's say you go to beauty school, um, doesn't guarantee you a job, yeah. doesn't guarantee that you're gonna be a successful professional makeup artist when you go out there because you could still take the course, 
be amazingly talented, but if you kind of sit there not doing anything, mm. you're not going to get much. So for the people asking, oh, is beauty school worth it? I mean, it's it's what you make of it. You yeah. do have to put work in. For every day you're not working, we, you know, when we're starting off, you know, realistically, you'll need that side job, obviously, because freelancing is difficult and you're not guaranteed to be working every day. But for yeah. every day you have off, sit down, work on your resume, build your... Um, build your book, work on your business cards, go out there, reach out, organize photo shoots, just make things happen. And yeah. I promise you guys, if you put work into it, you will see it come back. And I think it's important too, to not put yourself on some kind of timeline. Like a lot of people feel like, well, I've been working at this for like a year. I've been doing this for however long and they feel like things should be coming to fruition. But like, even if you've watched that happen to someone else, that doesn't necessarily mean that that timing is what's gonna happen for you. Um, and I think it's important to just like keep a good head on your shoulders and not um, sort of slip into that sense of entitlement of like feeling like you want your, like you paid your dues and it should be paying off now. Um, because some people work at it for years and so true. it takes a long time to get to where they want to be. When you're freelancing you're your own boss yeah you have to kick your own ass and nobody is gonna yeah you have to you have to wake up early and it's easy to not be motivated or sleep in a little extra mm -hmm. because when you are your own boss you make your own schedule but you have to be diligent okay so someone else asked what is the best way to get comfortable working on someone else's face okay so the best way is practice on someone mm. you know practice on some friends or your sister mother brother or whoever it may be because you know um that will be because doing this on yourself we all get used to our own touch yeah um but when you do this it's a completely different movement and you're not when you manhandle yourself we do it because we can if yeah, we yeah. do but sometimes people aren't aware and or they get uncomfortable doing it so you know this happens a lot or just pressing on the eyeballs really hard or but, feeling like they can't get into these tight spots mm -hmm. or they don't want to yeah yeah or, or being too nervous like oh i don't know but at least when you have that comfort of knowing someone then you can communicate with them mm -hmm. and let's say you're working on your best friend um they will tell you then oh okay that's too hard oh that's uncomfortable because yeah. you know you, they're going to be open about it whereas a client who doesn't know you may not necessarily voice that yeah it's a really great great way to learn by doing makeup on friends that don't wear a lot of makeup um because then you're navigating things like maybe their eyes are a little bit watery or like really twitchy or you know they are kind of like jumpy like because they're scared when you're doing their makeup <laughs> um or you know just different stuff like that i think that doing makeup on someone that doesn't normally wear it kind of helps you get used to um just just little things that uh you might not be ready for because i think a lot of the times when people are practicing they're seeking out like the most model-esque friend they have um, but not every client that comes in is going to have absolutely perfect beautiful model youthful skin mm -hmm. um, or like a perfect brow shape that doesn't need any retouching or that's such a yeah you know, no that's such a good point with um, with you know not the model-esque skin mm -hmm. um, because we get maybe so used to you know working with one skin or we seek out somebody yeah. with um, really good skin but not all the clients will have you know, the most perfectly smooth yeah. unblemished skin. So, or even the twitchiness or somebody who doesn't wear a lot of makeup. I think that is a really good point. And so you need to learn how to navigate that stuff because you can't avoid it. There's going to be clients that aren't, they have watery eyes or they have acne or scarring mm -hmm. or discoloration or whatever. Like you can't avoid those things and you should be comfortable navigating them. Um, even working on mature skin is really important. That's something a lot of people aren't confident doing um, and they don't really know how to navigate different things like that um, and working on different skin tones as well. A lot of people kind of get used to working on only their skin tone um, and so it can really throw you for a loop when you first do makeup on somebody that doesn't have the same skin tone as you and i think also like with that when you're practicing and stuff like that um, in terms of like growing your confidence if you see yourself really really gravitating towards a really specific look like let's say you just love like a smoky v and winged eyeliner that's what, like your look that you want to do on everyone it's what you do on yourself every day try and do something completely different from what you normally do if you normally do matte skin try and do dewy if you normally do full coverage try and do light coverage and vice versa whatever your not comfort zone is just go for that and try and do things that are different because again, you wanna be adaptable and be able to do everything. Someone asked, um, 
what do you do when a client requests a look that like you know is not going to be flattering or like maybe a, a color that you know might not be flattering or whatever what do you do then <laughs> oh god oh. <laughs> okay I just okay you want to meet in the middle how about that yeah but it also depends if it's for their wedding day really they're the client you want to cater to them but you want to also to the best of your ability um give them what they want but still making them look good yeah um if you know that's gonna look really bad um ask yourself is it really that bad or is it just your own opinion yeah yeah um figure that out first but um sometimes you may want to word things differently maybe come up with optional yeah you I think know. offering suggestions is a big yeah. one because mm -hmm. if it's something that, let's say for like a bridal look, most people end up wanting something pretty classic and pretty simple for bridal, but sometimes like you'll get that client that's like, I want a hot pink lip or whatever. And in that, I would usually kind of be like, oh, like, is that what you normally wear? Because if they normally wear a hot pink lip, great, ah. fine. But like, if they're like, no, I wear lip balm, then you could be like, Okay, yeah. well, maybe we should do like, you know, a tinted uh, like pink lip balm and like, yeah. you know, you want to kind of try and direct them because especially with bridal, I think that's a tricky one because obviously it's their day. So mm -hmm. you want them to look how they want to look. But at the same time, I think it's also important to try and navigate mm -hmm. not doing something that's going to look really bad in photos because they're going to have those photos for the rest yep. of their life yep. um, and something that's going to wear well as well. Yeah. You know what? Being honest. Yeah, because I would just straight up say that, you know, if they, if they're generally wearing lip balm, you know, you can bring that up and, yeah. and I'm really honest with, well, everybody in my life and I, I just, <laughs> I speak my mind, but it's again, how you say it, you can say, oh my God, yeah, hot pink is nice, but you're going to have these photos for a while. Why don't we try it? Um, but make me knock it down. What do you think about a tinted lip balm yeah. that still has a pink? What do you think? And giving yeah. suggestions because you may suggest a few things that they never would have thought of yeah. and then they may actually agree. Oh yeah, you're right. But if you're doing a shoot, let's say a photo shoot and, um, or uh, let's say you're doing a film, mm, if they have suggestions, uh, you know, you, they have no say a lot of the times. So. It's, the, it's whoever is commanding the shoot or the film or whatever kind of thing. So, but with stuff like that too, like if you're working on a photo shoot um, and whoever's directing it um, comes up to you and says like, I want you to do this and you know 100% like that's absolutely not going to look good on this person or on camera or whatever, you can always like speak your mind and say like, you know, like in my experience or whatever kind of thing, because you are the professional in that corner, right? So you wouldn't go up to the cameraman and tell him how to take a photograph or how to light his yeah. shoots or whatever. So mm -hmm. you can like definitely speak your mind, but I mean, there is always like order to things and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's being respectful. Yeah. And I was laughing or cringing, cringe laughing earlier because I thought of this Okay, I was doing um, this job where all the clients come in and you do a quickie little touch up. I forgot what it was for. And this lady sat in my chair and she's a wonderful, lovely, lovely lady. But she had the really, really um, just sperm brows mm. and it was um, big, big sperm head. <laughs> and it was sharp like an L, it was angled. So there was a big space missing and it went down and uh, I was like, ooh, I love eyebrows, I love, so this is awesome, I gotta fucking fix this up. And <laughs> as I kind of went in, she's like, oh, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna fill your brows. And I thought she'd be so, so glad, yes, fix them, thank you. Um, but she's like, oh, oh, no, 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 I want it that way. I was like, oh, you do? And I think the way I was like, surprised, she got offended, I was like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, no problem. And, and then at the end, I went to... <laughs> oh, so, yeah, so embarrassed. So I went to take the cape off and she thought I was going in for a hug. <laughs> and then she hugged me and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna take your cape off. Oh, Sorry, God. lady. <laughs> She really wanted those brows. So as much as I would say, gross, no, I'd like to fix them. Um, this is what she wanted, so, and it made her happy. And if that's what makes her feel beautiful, then awesome. So someone asked how to deal with uh, really difficult clients if they were rude, indecisive, not satisfied, etc. Okay, so I think it's really important, no matter how rude someone is or condescending, um, just stay professional. And I'm not saying you have to kiss ass, but don't 
don't snap back. Don't, you know, you want to make sure you still, I mean, kill them with kindness. But mm -hmm. normally what I try to do is explain, you know, whatever problems they're having, um, just kind of explain what you're about to do and why you're doing it. Um, just perform your services and be as professional as possible. And, you know, it's just, I normally acknowledge what they're trying to say. In terms of like them being indecisive, that's where like it, it's really um, helpful to like ask them questions like what kind of makeup do they normally wear? What kind of styles do they normally like? Is there any photos that they have? Whatever kind of thing. And then you can just kind of like offer directions in terms of like where to take the makeup um, if it's just an indecisiveness problem. Uh, yeah. Honestly, like there's been clients that like I thought they were super rude and I thought maybe they were unhappy and stuff like that, but they went on to like talk about me really positively and say they had a great time and whatever. So sometimes it's just like our perception as well and especially like, you know, being artists, some of us are sensitive. And uh, someone else asked, uh, where would you find the most consistent pool of clientele? Ugh, it's, it's difficult when you're first starting out as a freelance artist because a lot of the times the jobs can be super spot um, and I think that the biggest thing with that is to not like put yourself on too narrow of a path um, Because I think a lot of people are like, oh, I want to do photo shoots But there's not photo shoots necessarily every single week Especially if you're not in like a super like busy area like that. So I think mm -hmm. it's important to kind of have um, You know clients across a few different categories like doing some hair shows doing some fashion shows yep. doing some shoots doing some bridal uh, grad makeup different stuff like that films if you're in a city that caters to that yeah and you never know where the job is going to come from yeah and i think it's really handy if you get a job let's say at mac or shoppers drug more mm. shoppers drug mark or any kind of beauty boutique because not only are you you're making sure you get your rent paid mm. right you get that paycheck um and if something that if it's something that you can work part-time that's awesome because you can still balance your freelancing and work there but you also get gratis so you can build your kit mm. and let's say you work at shoppers drug mart um what's the state's equivalent um like a like ulta um so you get to learn or let's say sephora you get to learn about a, a so many different products. And if you get gratis, you can build your kit as well. Yeah. And then you can also dabble in the client makeovers. Yeah, um, and getting used to working on different people and just whoever walks in and stuff. And that's a huge thing, having a good attitude. Yeah. Having a really good attitude because that's, that's something you can't train. Let's say you're not the best with makeup skills, that's trainable. But if you're the most amazing, talented makeup artist doing you know the makeup yeah. on the face, but you know you don't have a good attitude, that's, you know, that's not trainable, but you can always train the skill. And I think that's yeah. so important, not having that entitlement and being friendly and... Yeah, and I do think that that's something that's really shifted kind of like with the um, popularity of social media and stuff like that. Because I think that, you know, traditionally like makeup artists were crew. Like they're like behind the scenes, they're not like the superstar. Um, and I think that with this shift in popularity surrounding how many people are interested in makeup, how many people want to be makeup artists, how many people want to be on social media doing makeup, all that kind of stuff. I think that the, the mentality and the idea of what being a makeup artist looks like has really changed. And now people feel like, you know, they're kind of like the star of the show or they're the most important part. Um, and I think that, you know, managing that belief is really important as well because at the end of the day you are in a customer based mm -hmm. experience um even if it's not like even if you're working on actors or whatever um the director is then your customer and you are trying to you know make everyone happy and if you are showing up with a bad attitude and always wanting people to cater to you um or you're just really difficult to be around or you know you're entitled or whatever nobody has time for it nobody wants to be around that and because makeup is such a personal thing you're working so closely with people mm -hmm. it's it's really really important to yeah, be yeah you don't always call the shots yeah the truth is like as much as it feels like it's so competitive and so saturated it's a very small little world. <laughs> yeah. So that is everything for today, you guys. Sorry, I know this is a really long video as well, um, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys learned some good little tips and tricks. Thank you again to Trey for coming on my channel uh, and providing her expertise and knowledge. All right, guys, I'll see you next time. Peace out.